one step phrase though. Because of your unbelief. Jesus outlines unbelief as a thing which robs God of the opportunity to do the miraculous in the lives of men. The disciples, perhaps, having been day to day with Christ, had grown mechanical. How often do we do that in our own lives? In our day to day, we just take it for granted. We take it for granted and grow mechanical in our Christian walk. Perhaps they had grown mechanical in the work of ministry, thus believing in themselves for the word, rather than the God to whom accomplished the work through them. Oftentimes, likewise, we can see the results as a result of programs and systems rather than for what they are, an outward manifestation of God's almighty hand at work in the lives of men. And when that takes place, when that takes place, we limit God. We limit God because we have put him in a box. Because of our unbelief. We, we limit God because of our unbelief. And the God who authored our faith. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 tells us that we are to be ever this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Notice, Jesus in Matthew 17 in verse 20 gives further testimony of what is both possible notice this, it is possible and available but it's only through faith. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, he's not asking for much. He's just saying you can have faith as a grain of mustard seed. He's not asking us to have a dump truck load of faith. He's saying saying, seeing is believing, that is not a saying rooted in faith. If you have the substance before you, or if you can see it, there's no need of faith. Faith is needed for what we can't see and cannot touch. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith. Notice, our walk is to be by faith. Not by sight. Not by sight. Therefore, the saying, seeing is believing, should not bear any merit in the life of a born-again child of God. For true faith is believing, yet not seen. <clears throat> Hebrews 11.6 tells us, but without faith, it is impossible. It is impossible. It is impossible. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you want to please God, you've got to live a life of faith. There is no restraint to the Lord. The one who spoke the world into the existence is capable of doing great and mighty things if we have faith. Notice this. Mark this down. In accordance with his divine will, and allow him to work through us. You know, sometimes we say, Lord, we send laborers. <clears throat> send laborers, Lord, into the harvest field. And don't subject ourselves to that equation. Yeah. Allowing ourselves to be used by God. Yeah. <sighs> Notice what Jesus testifies of faith when it is present. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 20. You see, faith is believing God despite the circumstances. That is, the substance of faith encompassed about that which is hoped for. Hebrews 11.10 tells us, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. <clears throat> we see it's evidence, second one. It's evidence. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. 
just as our physical eyesight is a sense that gives us the evidence of the material world, faith is the sense. It is the sense that gives us the evidence of the indiv invisible spiritual world. Evidence is defined as that which elucidates and enables the mind to see truth, proof arising from our own perception by the senses or from the testimony of others. Think about that. Testimony of others. We have those who have gone before. whose testimonies are recorded in the word of God. Testimony of others. Or from inductions of reason. Our senses furnish evidence of the ex existence of matter, of solidity, of color, of heat, and cold. Faith takes God at his word and trusts in his promises. Jesus said, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Faith does not require God to prove himself. Think about that for a moment. Faith does not require God to make a case for himself. It's simply trust him. It's simply trust him. Hebrews 11.13 tells us, These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Faith does not simply live in the here now. It lives in life eternity. Think about this for a moment. Notice what the Bible tells us of these folks. Having seen them afar off, they're looking beyond their circumstances. Notice this also. They were persuaded of them. Are you persuaded of the promises in this book? Are you clinging unto them? Notice what the Bible tells us. How that they embrace them. They embrace the promises of God contained in his word. Are we doing the same? Are we embracing the promises of God and His Word, trusting in Him? These folks listed here in Hebrews 11 had their eyes on heaven, and that which God promised was to come. They were persuaded by the promises of God. Romans 14 and verse 5 tells us, Let every man, let every man be fully persuaded. Not partially, but fully persuaded. Fully persuaded in his own mind. They took him and his word by faith. Furthermore, they embraced those promises. They clung to them throughout the highs and lows of their lives. Don't just wait. Don't just wait, folks, until troubles come, until trials arise. You need to know what the promises of God's word are. And he will give you a firm foundation upon which to stand when the storms come, and they will come. They'll give you a firm foundation upon which to stand. It's hard to cling to God's promises if we are ignorant of them. Therefore, if we are fluent in them and embrace them, they will keep us grounded to the rock that is higher than I. And when the storms come, 2 Timothy 1, 7 tells us, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Okay, if God has not given us the spirit of fear, who has? That old serpent. The devil. That old dragon. He's the one who's trying to make us fearful. But the word of God tells us, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Where faith abides, fear subsides. Therefore we see faith is the evidence of things not seen. Thirdly, we see it's understanding. Through faith, we understand. There in verse 3. Faith gives us the understanding to trust the self-existing God from whom all things consist and by whom they were made. When we do not exhibit faith in God, it is because we place our faith in ourselves. It is because we place our faith in ourselves and we're not trusting the promises of God's word. It is because we are viewing the circumstances through the lens of our own humanity rather than 
focusing upon God's omnipotence. The Bible calls this sin in Romans 14, 23. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We can go and do mighty things on our own, leaving God out of it entirely. And that is sin. God is to have the preeminence in our lives. Again and again, God asks men to do not what they can, but what they can't. Why? To prove. God is proving a point. To prove that no sleight of hand does it, but that they link their impotence to his omnipotence. The word impossible is then dropped from their vocabularies. Notice, if you recall back in 1 Samuel chapter 17, let's all turn on over there. It's the famous account of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll look at verses 45 on down to 47. The Bible tells us, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But notice this. I love the way David talks. But I come to thee. What's he say? Does he say, I'm coming to thee in my name? No. Notice what he says. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. What is David doing here? He's telling his Philistine, you haven't just defied the armies of Israel. You've defied the Lord God. This day, this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. David is trusting God by faith for the victory. He is trusting God for the victory to overcome this giant, the one who the armies of Israel cowered in fear from. He's a lone man. But he's not standing alone. He's standing with an almighty God. He's standing with the God, the Lord of hosts. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day under the fowls of the air and under the wild beasts of the earth. Notice this. Notice that next phrase. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Think about this for a moment. David is trusting God for the victory. Why? That those around, those countries around, may know that there is a God in Israel. When you take God and trust Him by faith, standing upon His promises, Those around you will realize there is a God in white name. There is a God at work here in white name. And he is able to give the victory. And all this assembly, verse 47, and all this assembly shall know who's he talking about there? He's talking about the folks behind him. The army of Israel who's cowering in fear. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. Notice this. For the battle is the Lord's. When we go through battles in life, we need to remember the battle is the Lord's. We need to trust the promises of God's word and realize the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you. David did not enter the battle for himself. He entered the battle by faith, lifting up the name of the Lord, magnifying the fact that God was going to have the victory because the battle was the Lord's. When you understand by faith that the battle is the Lord's, we enter the conflict, resting upon the fact that God will have his perfect way. Fourthly, we see its merit. We see faith's merit. Look on over back, if you will, to Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 2. Hebrews, chapter 11, and verse 2. Notice this. 
for by it the elders obtained a good report. The same statement is yet again laid out for us in verse 39. And these all have obtained a good report through faith. A good report. As we read and understand Hebrews 11, we come to the realization that if we are, as believers, are to obtain a good report with God, we must do so by faith. It is then that we hear, well done, thou good. Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, 23. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Hebrews 11, 2. For it, the it there, is faith. Without it, one cannot obtain a good report from God. For the Bible says, the Bible says, not the wood says, but the Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Are you seeking God today? Are you seeking to draw closer to God? To walk closer to God? If we want to please God and obtain a good report from Him, we must live lives of faith. I want to remind you all, the folks listed here in Hebrews 11 were not without their faults. They were not without their faults. They had their highs and lows throughout life. <clears throat> Yet, that did not stop them from living lives of faith and taking God at His word. We went over this passage uh, in the preceding service where the Bible tells us in James 5, 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. We need to get this, we need to get past this platform we have placed these individuals of faith upon and see them as they are, average people, yeah. average people who by faith stood upon the promises, believing God. As we come to a close, let me ask you a question. Does my life exemplify my faith in God? If not, why not? If not, how can we live our lives by faith? The answer, though simple, is still true. For example, how are we saved? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The same God who saves us by faith is the same God we can live for by faith. But the only way to do that is embracing and clinging to the promises of God in His Word. Ephesians 6 16 tells us, Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. How often do we go through life and rather than keeping that shield of faith up, we let it go down to the side. We let it go down to the side and allow the attacks of the enemy. By taking hold of the shield of faith, God enables us to withstand the attacks and storms that encompass us. But we need to take a hold of that shield for if we lower it, we may fall prey to the attacks of the enemy, and as Paul warned, becoming a castaway. It is by faith that we can say, as did the Apostle Paul in the midst of the storm tossed sea, in the midst of the Arachnidon, that massive storm which wrecked the ship he was traveling upon in Acts 27 25, when he says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, this storm raging on. And here's Paul. He's encouraging folks. Be of good cheer. Notice this statement. For I believe God that he shall be, even as it was told me. God's not changing. His promises are still true. They are still relevant. They're still trustworthy. And you can take them to the bank. Notice what he says there. For I believe God that it shall be, it shall be, even as it was told me. You take these promises in the word of God, and you can believe them, even as they're given unto you. If 
you leave here today with only one thing, grab a hold of this. Faith is believing God despite the circumstances. Don't go through life allowing your circumstances to dictate whether or not you're going to believe God. Believe God despite the circumstances. Faith is believing God despite the circumstances. Circumstances circumstances ought never to dictate our faith in God. We need to keep trusting God. And you know how we do that? We get in the book. We study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You want to know what the Bible says so you can cling to those promises. Don't wait for the storm to come. Because by then it will be too late. You need to know those promises. Cling to those promises. That way when the storm comes, you'll have something to draw from. You'll have the promises to cling to. We need to stand upon the promises of God's word and not allow the enemy to take a foothold in our lives and make us question those promises. God said those promises. Therefore, I believe those promises. We need to cling to them. We'll close in a word of prayer and I'll turn the service on to you, brother. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, Lord, and the promises contained within you. Lord, I pray that you would stir each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Help us to walk in faith, Lord. Help us to walk in faith, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us throughout life, Lord. Help us, Lord, not to allow the storms to come, Lord, and to overthrow our faith, Lord. But I pray that you would help us, Lord, to cling to your promises, Lord. That way we can have that solid foundation, Lord. Rock that is higher than I, Lord, that we can cling to and make confident. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the promises of your word, Lord. Help us to dig into them and embrace them, Lord. In Jesus' holy name.